In today's video, we'll look at two bizarre murder cases. The first case was classified for over 50 years. The second case, while solved, still haunts the people of West Virginia. But before that, we want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Rage Shadow Legends. I know you're probably bored by now, so why not check out one of the coolest games around, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is an awesome dark fantasy role-playing game that is free to play on both your mobile device and your PC. There is so much to do in this game, like battling other players in the arena or playing a fully developed campaign mode. But my favorite way to play is Dungeon Battles, which is where you fight giant bosses for artifacts that help you level up your heroes. There is something awe-inspiring about leading your team of heroes against a ferocious dragon or a gigantic spider. Patch 1.15 is coming in May, and with it, you'll be able to compete in the brand new arena tournament. You'll be able to earn points according to your tier in both local and global tournaments, and you'll be able to win some awesome rewards. So what are you waiting for? Go to the description box, click on the special links, and if you are a new player, you will get 100,000 silver plus one free champion, Shotan. Make sure you sign up today because the rewards are only available for the next 30 days. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. Good luck and I'll see you there. Number 2 Andre Monet In the summer of 1887, 35-year-old Robert Ledru was considered one of the best detectives in Paris, France. During his career, he had solved some major cases. Notably, he had broken up a cult that was involved in black magic, and he foiled a plot to overthrow the French government. A lot of Ledru's success stemmed from the fact that he was incredibly hardworking. He often worked 20 hours a day, and he rarely took a day off. However, because he worked so hard, many people thought he was heading for a nervous breakdown. Sometime in that summer of 1887, Ledru was sent to Lavarve. Lavarve is a beach commune in northwest France. Ledru was sent to the commune because six sailors had been murdered there and the local police were not making much progress on the case. Ledru got to work on the case once he arrived in the commune. But that evening, Ledru was not feeling like himself. He was exhausted, and he could barely keep his eyes open. He decided to go to bed early. Twelve hours later, he woke up refreshed. As he was getting dressed, he noticed that his socks were wet and sandy. Also, it appeared that someone had rifled through his belongings, but nothing appeared to be stolen. Detective Ledru put all this to the back of his mind and he went to work investigating the case of the murdered sailors. That evening, Ledru returned to his hotel and discovered that there was a wire for him. It was from his boss in Paris. It turned out that the night before, a man had been murdered on a beach that was about two miles from Ledru's hotel. LeDru went to the local police station the next morning. By this point, the police had learned quite a bit about the victim. The victim's name was Andre Monet and he was on vacation. He was a small business owner in Paris and he had come to the beach by himself. Monet was married, but his wife had sent him on the vacation in the hopes that the beach air would help him with the summer cold that he had been suffering from. Monet had a few friends and no enemies. Monet and his wife did not have any serious marital problems and neither was having an extramarital affair. Ledru learned that two nights earlier, Monet had gone out for a naked swim on the beach. The next morning, his dead, naked body was found on the beach. He had been shot once in the chest at point-blank range. The local police were having a hard time determining the motive. Monet's clothes were found folded on the beach and they had not been touched. Also, none of Monet's possessions had been stolen. 
Finally, there had been no signs of a struggle. It appeared that someone just walked up to Monet after he got out of the water, shot him, and then walked away. The police had two pieces of evidence. The first was the bullet that killed Monet. An expert determined that the bullet had been fired from a Luger. The police also found footprints in the sand near the body. It appeared that the killer had only been wearing socks. The police did not think that the bullet nor the footprints would lead to the killer. The model of Luger that was used in the murder was quite common. They also thought that finding the killer based on his stocking feet was going to be impossible. They thought if the prints showed what type of footwear the killer was wearing, that might have helped with their investigation. Detective Robert LeDru was undeterred. LeDru was taken to the beach where Monet's body was found and he began looking at the footprints in the sand. He was shocked by what he found. He noted that the killer was missing the big toe on his right foot. This shocked him because he was missing the big toe on his right foot. It was amputated a few years earlier after he was shot in the toe. Since LeDru was a detective, he carried a gun. His gun was a Luger. LeDru asked for the bullet that killed Monet. He then went back to his hotel room and fired a bullet into a pillow. He then compared the grooves on the bullet that he fired into the pillow to the grooves on the bullet that killed Monet. He concluded that the grooves were the same. Detective LeDru went straight back to Paris and he immediately went to his supervisor. LeDru told his supervisor that he knew who the killer was. LeDru said he was the one who murdered Andre Monet. LeDru explained that the grooves on the bullet found in Monet's chest matched the grooves his gun made. LeDru also told his supervisor about the killer's footprints in the sand and that the killer was missing the big toe on his right foot. He then proceeded to show his boss his right foot. Finally, he showed his boss his socks that were damp and sandy on the morning that Monet's body was found. The socks were now stiff and covered with sand. LeDru's boss asked him why he killed Monet and LeDru said he wasn't sure. He said that the only explanation he could come up with was that he killed Monet while he was sleepwalking. LeDru was then put under observation by several doctors. One night, the doctors were watching him, and while he was still asleep, he got out of bed, he got dressed, but he did not put on his shoes. Then he left his home and started walking around the streets of Paris. As he walked, a man crossed his path. LeDru took out his gun, aimed it at the man, and fired. Amazingly, the sound of the gunshot did not wake him up. LeDru then walked back home, got undressed, and got into bed. Luckily, the bullets in LeDru's gun had been replaced with blanks, and the man was uninjured. The doctors concluded that LeDru was overworked, and this strained his mind, which led to the sleepwalking. LeDru was eventually sent to live on a farm in Nice, France. Every night, he was placed in a locked room, and he was guarded by a police officer. He lived that way for 50 years. Robert LeDru passed away in November 1937. The story of Andre Monet's murder remained a secret until after LeDru's death. Number 1. Marin Malaric and Karen Farrell In early 1970, Marin Malaric and Karen Farrell were 19 years old. They were both attending the University of West Virginia, which is in Morgantown, West Virginia. On the night of January 18, 1970, 
they and two other friends went to a movie theater in downtown Morgantown. After the movie, Malory and Farrell decided to hitchhike to their dormitory, which was about a mile outside of town. Their friends watched them get into a cream or light colored Chevrolet. A man was driving the car, and he was alone. That was the last time their friends saw them. Farrell and Malarick were reported missing the next day. The police began investigating immediately. A reward of $3,500 was offered for information regarding their whereabouts. But for months, the whereabouts of the young women, and if they were alive or dead, remained mysteries. Then on April 6, 1970, less than three months after the disappearance, the governor of West Virginia, Arch A. Moore Jr., received a mysterious letter. It reads, Gentlemen, I have some information on the whereabouts of the bodies of the two missing West Virginia co-eds, Barrett Ballerick and Karen Farrell. Follow directions very carefully, to the nth degree, you cannot fail to find them. Proceed 25 miles directly south from the southern line of Morgantown. This will bring you to a wooded forest land. Enter into the forest exactly one mile. There are the bodies. 25 plus 1 equals 26 miles total. Will reveal myself when the bodies are located. Then the letter was signed off, sincerely, and someone drew a triangle. Four days after receiving the letter, the governor announced that they were searching the area indicated in the letter. But he said he was confident the searches would turn up nothing. He turned out to be correct. Nothing of interest was found. Four days later, the governor received another letter. This one was dated April 10th which was the day the governor announced that the police were conducting searches of the area described in the first letter. The second letter reads, Gentlemen, I saw the article in this morning's newspaper concerning my previous letter on the two missing co-eds. If you reread my first letter carefully, you will see the directions were specific direct south from the city, meaning the southern limit of Morgantown, West Virginia. Straight south 25 miles, you will come to a forest woodland. Enter in one mile south. Fanning out, you will locate the bodies of the girls covered over with brush. Look carefully. The animals are now on the move. Do you trust this will help you to the exact location? Will still identify myself when the bodies are located. Then once again, the letter was signed off sincerely, and then there was a triangle. Once again, the police searched the area. This time, they found something. About six miles from Morgantown, in some wooded area, they found a makeshift tomb. In the tomb were the remains of two young women. They were headless, and their skulls were nowhere to be found. Animals had gotten to the bodies, so they were mostly just skeletons. An extensive search of the area was conducted, but the skulls were nowhere to be found. It was later determined that it was the remains of Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. The medical examiner could not determine a cause of death. There were no signs of sexual assault. The tomb where the remains were found had been constructed by someone or several people who dragged six or seven slabs of stone from a creek that was about 30 feet from where the remains were found. Then some brush was piled on top of the slabs of stone. Some residents of Morgantown thought that the construction of the tomb was ritualistic and they feared that the murders were the work of Satanists. Five days after the remains were found, the Morgantown police received a strange letter. It reads, Gentlemen, I have delayed writing another letter and hope you will conclude more information by this time concerning the finding of the bodies. Since this has not substantially happened, I will send along another clue while your men are still in the area. 
the heads can be found from the position of the bodies by striking out 10 degrees southwest for the first head and approximately 10 degrees southeast for the second head, roughly one mile. You are already seven-tenths of that mile. They are within the mine entrance, if you could call it an entrance, considering its condition. They are buried not over one foot in depth. The ones responsible for the murder scattered some of the girls' personal effects over the general area, creating a pattern of confusion, making it difficult for you to pinpoint any exact location. My first two letters triggered your intensive search. Don't give up now. Once again, the letter was signed off, sincerely, Triangle. The police searched the areas, but the skulls were nowhere to be found. Then a week later, the Malarick family received a letter. It reads, I have sent three letters to the Morgantown State Police Detachment concerning your daughter Merit and Karen. The first and second were taken with some seriousness and instituted a search which was successful in locating two bodies, minus the heads, which were needed for other purposes. All of a sudden, the police are complaining about an errant mileage stated in my second letter. After one has driven an oval pattern for 26 miles under the weather conditions of Jan and under the involved circumstances, it is possible to make about an 18-mile error in the precise location of the bodies. Nevertheless, they were found south of Morgantown, as stated in the letter, even to which was called a logging lane or an old mine road, in my opinion, both the same. The author then goes on to give the same directions to the skulls that appeared in the third letter. Finally, once again the letter was signed off, sincerely, and then there was a triangle. Once again, the police searched the area indicated in the letter, but the skulls were not found. Then at the end of August 1970, the leader of a cult based in Laval, Maryland, called the Psychiatric Science Church, got in contact with the police in Morgantown. His name was R. Warren Hoover, and the cult had about 15 members. One of the followers was a man named Fred Shanning. Shanning had been following the investigation into Malarick and Farrell's disappearance. He decided to ask Hoover to help with the investigation. They held a seance and a spirit supposedly took over Hoover's body. The spirit was a 19th century doctor who had lived in London, England, named Dr. Spencer. During the seance, Hoover said that the bodies could be found 25 miles south of Morgantown. He also said they would be buried in triangular graves. After the seance, Shannon got his niece to write the first letter that was sent to the governor. When the bodies weren't found, Shannon got her to write the second letter. After the bodies were found, Hoover and Shannon did another seance. Then Hoover sent the third and fourth letters. Hoover and Shanning immediately became suspects in the murders. But in July 1971, they were officially cleared as suspects. Part of the problem with Hoover and Shanning is that they said that the bodies were about 25 miles south of Morgantown. But they were actually found six miles from Morgantown. The police think that it was just dumb luck that Hoover and Shanning predicted that the bodies would be found in a wooded area south of the city. The police continued to investigate the murders of Merrin Malarick and Karen Farrell. There was no shortage of suspects. This included members of a rock band called Ezra. The band may have been in Morgantown on the night Malarick and Farrell went missing. Also, on May 30th, 1969, about six months before Malarick and Farrell were killed, Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry, who were both 19, were stabbed to death in Summers Point, New Jersey. Their bodies were found in some underbrush near a freeway in Summers Point, three days after they were killed. The band Ezra hailed from the area where Davis and Perry were killed. 
Davis and Perry's murders are unsolved, but many people, including family members of the victims, think that Ted Bundy is responsible for the double homicide. Bundy is not considered a suspect in the murders of Malarick and Farrell. Whether the police cleared the members of Ezra as suspects in the murders of Malarick and Farrell is unknown. Another suspect in the murders of Mary Malarick and Karen Farrell emerged in April 1973, nearly four years after the killings. It was after a man named Gerard John Schaefer was linked to the murders of two teenage girls in Martin County, Florida. When Schaefer was linked to the murders, he was sitting in jail because five months earlier, he had been convicted of aggravated assault from an incident that happened on July 22, 1972. At the time of the incident, Schaefer had been a sheriff's deputy with the Martin County Sheriff's Department. On July 21, 1972, while Schaefer was on duty, he picked up two young women who were hitchhiking. One was 18 and the other was 17. He told them that hitchhiking was illegal in the area, which wasn't true. He then drove them to the halfway house where they were crashing. When Schaefer dropped them off, he offered to drive them to the beach in the morning and they accepted. Schaefer picked them up the next morning, but he did not take them to the beach. Instead, he took them to Hutchinson Island, which is a narrow island just off the coast of eastern Florida. He got them out of the car and handcuffed them. He also gagged them and he put nooses around their necks. He then tied them to a tree. But then Schaefer got a call on his radio and he was forced to leave the girls tied to the tree. When he returned hours later, he discovered that they had escaped. Schaefer went to the sheriff's headquarters and learned that the young women were there already. Schaefer explained to his boss that he had tied the young women to a tree to teach them why they shouldn't hitchhike. Schaefer's boss did not think that his actions were appropriate and he was charged with false imprisonment. Schaefer then posted bail and he was released from jail. About five months later, in December 1972, Schaefer agreed to a plea deal where he pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of aggravated assault. He was sentenced to a year in jail and his sentence began on January 16, 1973. About five months later, the mother of a missing teenage girl made a startling revelation. The missing young woman was 18-year-old Susan Place. Susan had vanished on the evening of September 27, 1972, about two and a half months after Schaefer was arrested for false imprisonment. Earlier on the evening that Susan went missing, she was at home in Oakland Park, Florida with her mother, Lucille Place. At some point in the evening, Susan's friend, 17-year-old Georgia Jessup, arrived at their home with a man who was a few years older than the girls. He was introduced to Lucille as Gerard. The trio hung out in Susan's room for a bit, and then they left in Gerard's blue Datsun. Lucille had a bad feeling about Gerard, so she wrote down his license plate. Susan did not come home that night or in the days that followed. Neither did her friend, Georgia. Their families reported them missing. Lucille told the police about Gerard with the blue Datsun and gave them the license plate. But the information did not lead to any clues regarding the whereabouts of Susan and Georgia. Six months went by and no trace of Susan or Georgia had been found. Then, at the end of March 1973, Lucille realized that she had written down the license plate incorrectly. As she was driving around Martin County, she realized that the license plates issued for the vehicles in that county started with the number 42. Lucille realized she had just written down 4 and missed the 2. She then had someone look up the license plate she had written down 
but she had them use the number 42 instead of 4. When they did, Lucille found out that the car belonged to Gerard Schaefer. Lucille then found a photograph of Schaefer, which was not difficult because he had been in the news because of his conviction for aggravated assault. She was sure he was the man who came to her home that evening and left with Susan in Georgia. Lucille went to the police and told them that her daughter was last seen with Gerard Schaefer. On April 1st, 1973, just days after Lucille went to the police, three men were looking for beer cans in an isolated area on Hutchinson Island. They came across some body parts. They called the police who came and searched the area. The police discovered more human remains. It appeared to be the remains of two young women who had been dismembered. The police also found evidence that the young women had been tied to a tree close to where their remains were found. Within five days, both sets of remains were identified. They were the remains of 18-year-old Susan Place and 17-year-old Georgia Jessup. Since Schaefer had been the last person seen with them, and since he had been convicted of tying teenage girls to a tree, the police got a search warrant to search his home and his mother's home. When the police searched his mother's home, they found a trunk in the attic. Inside the trunk were items like women's jewelry, women's clothes, diaries, a passport, driver's license, and even some teeth. The police thought that the items belonged to at least 30 women. They also found some handwritten stories that Schaefer had authored. The stories are about the murders of several women, and they are all told from the point of view of the killer. The police were sure that the stories were about murders that Schaefer had committed. But Schaefer claimed that the writings were nothing but fiction. After the discovery of the items, investigators in West Virginia thought that Schaefer might have killed Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. They noticed several similarities between their kidnapping and murders and the crimes Schaefer committed. Notably, he kidnapped pairs of physically attractive young women who were hitchhiking. He had also dismembered at least two of his victims. When Gerard was questioned about Malarick and Farrell's murders, he claimed he knew nothing about the killings. He said he had never even heard of Morgantown, West Virginia. The police found no physical evidence that connected him to the murders of Malarick and Farrell. So Schaefer was not charged in connection with their murders, but he was not dropped as a suspect either. The state attorney of Florida, Robert Stone, thought that Schaefer was responsible for 34 murders. However, Schaefer only ended up being charged with the murders of Susan Place and Georgia Jessup. Schaefer went to trial for their murders in September 1973 and he was convicted. A month later, he was given two life sentences. Publicly, Schaefer had always maintained that he was not a serial killer. He claimed that he was being framed. Years went by, then February 1989, a woman named Sandra London got in contact with Schaefer in prison. London had dated Schaefer when she was 17 and Schaefer was 18. They broke up when London moved away for college. London wanted to publish Schaefer's writings that were found in the trunk in his mother's attic. Schaefer agreed. The collection was published in late 1989 under the title Killer Fiction. Schaefer and London continued to correspond in the years after the book was published. Their relationship even turned romantic and in 1991 they were engaged briefly. But then London ended the relationship and proclaimed that Schaefer really was a serial killer and his stories were not fiction. 
In December 1995, 49-year-old Gerard Schaefer was found stabbed to death in his cell. Prison officials said that Schaefer was killed by 32-year-old Vincent Rivera. Rivera had a history of mental illness, and before he came to prison, he had been a drifter. He had been convicted of two murders he committed in February 1990. Rivera was eventually convicted of Schaefer's murder, and he was sentenced to 53 years in prison. Prison officials said that Rivera killed Schaefer because of a disagreement over a cup of coffee. But several people do not believe the official story. Sandra London believes the guards were involved in the murder. Shaver's family believes he was killed because he had been cooperating with the police regarding the July 1981 murder of Adam Walsh. At the time, the police were investigating the possibility that a convicted serial killer, Otis Toole, had killed Adam. Shaver's family said that Schaefer had information regarding Toole. Shaver was hoping that if he helped with the investigation, he would be released early. The prison officials have denied this, and they have maintained that Vincent Rivera, the convicted killer with a history of mental illness, killed Schaefer, and he acted on his own. Two years after Schaefer's death, another edition of Killer Fiction was released. This edition contained letters that Gerard Schaefer had written to Sandra London and transcripts of discussions he supposedly had with Ted Bundy while they were in prison together. According to Schaefer, Bundy deeply respected and admired him. In the conversations Schaefer supposedly had with Bundy, he claimed he had killed over a hundred women. In the letters that Schaefer wrote to London, he confesses to eight murders. Also, in the years since Schaefer's death, more investigating has been done to see if Schaefer is connected to any other murders. This is what is known about Gerard John Schaefer. He was born in Wisconsin in March 1946, but he grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. When he was in high school, his family moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He graduated from high school in 1964. Schaefer grew up Catholic and he applied to the seminary so he could become a priest. However, he was rejected, so he decided to leave the Catholic Church. Instead, he attended Broward Community College in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's believed that during this time, Schaefer committed his first murders. On October 2, 1966, 21-year-old Nancy Leichner and 20-year-old Pamela Nader were on a picnic in a state park in Altoona, Florida. Altoona is about 250 miles from Fort Lauderdale, where Schaefer, who was 20 years old, was living at the time. Leichner and Nader walked into the woods, and they were never seen again. Their remains have never been found. In 2006, cold case investigators were going over the case. They found out that Schaefer had told another inmate he had killed Leichner and Nader. Also, in 1983, Schaefer wrote to the Sheriff's Department in the county where Leichner and Nader went missing, and he basically dared them to question him about the disappearance of the two women. Finally, the cold case investigators show witnesses who were at the state park on the day the two women went missing a photograph of Schaefer. They said he was the man following Leichner and Nader on the day they went missing. So in July 2007, the cold case investigators closed the case, citing Schaefer as the killer of the two women. In 1968, Schaefer transferred to Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton. That same year, he got married. On September 8, 1969, a former neighbor of Schaefer's, 25-year-old Lee Hainline Bonadies, vanished from her Boca Raton apartment. When they were teenagers, Schaefer would spy on Hainline Bonadies as she sunbathed. Hainline Bonadies had been married for about a month before she went missing. 
Days before she went missing, she had told her husband that she had met up with someone she went to high school with. She had mentioned he worked for the CIA. After Hayline Bonadies went missing, her family hired a private investigator. He discovered that shortly before she went missing, she had played tennis with Schaefer. After Schaefer was arrested, some of Hayline Bonadies' possessions were found in the trunk in his mother's attic. Lee Hayline Bonadies' remains were found nine years after she went missing, but she was not identified until 2004. While Schaefer was studying in university, he planned to become a teacher. In the fall of 1969, he got an intern position at a high school in Boca Raton. On December 18, 1969, 22-year-old cocktail waitress, Carmen Halleck, went missing for Fort Lauderdale. On the night Halleck went missing, she told someone she was planning on meeting up with a teacher who also did undercover work for the government. Two of her teeth were found in Schaefer's trunk. It is the only remains of Halleck that have ever been found. About two weeks after Halleck vanished, on December 29, 1969, nine-year-old Peggy Ron and her friend, eight-year-old Wendy Stevenson, went missing from the beach in Pompano Beach, Florida. Their remains have never been found. In Shaver's letters to Sandra London, he confesses to killing Peggy and Wendy. He said he had read about notorious serial killer Albert Fish and it inspired him to do horrible things to their bodies. However, no physical evidence has been found to verify Shaver's claims that he killed the two girls. But the families of both girls believe that Schaefer is their killer. A few weeks later, Marin Malrick and Karen Farrell were kidnapped and killed in West Virginia. Like Schaefer did with all the murders he committed, he denied killing Malarick and Farrell. But according to Killer Fiction, Schaefer told Ted Bundy that he liked to collect things from his victims. He said that he had driven to West Virginia and he killed two college girls. He decided to collect and keep their heads. However, he had to get rid of them because they had decomposed too much. The problem is, is that there is no physical evidence that ties Schaefer to the murders of Malarick and Farrell. Plus, it appears that Schaefer killed all his victims in Florida. Malarick and Farrell were killed over a thousand miles away from Schaefer's home, and there is no evidence that Schaefer was ever in West Virginia. Later in 1970, Schaefer got divorced from his wife. He got remarried in 1971. He graduated from university in August 1971 with a degree in geography. Shaver's career plans to be a teacher did not work out. He had been fired from his internship for inappropriate behavior. He then decided to get into law enforcement. He was hired as a patrolman with the Wilton Manors Police Department. However, he was let go before completing his six-month probation period. He was apparently let go because he had been looking for another job and the chief of police heard about it. Schaefer was then hired by the Martins County Sheriff's Department to be a deputy. A few weeks later, Schaefer was charged with kidnapping after he left two girls tied to a tree and he was fired from the sheriff's department. He posted bail, and then a couple of months later, he killed Susan Place and Georgia Jessup. About a month later, on October 23, 1972, two 14-year-old girls, Mary Berscalona and Elsie Farmer, went missing from Oakland Park, Florida. Their skeletal remains were found in mid-January 1973 in Plantation, Florida, which is about 10 miles from where they were last seen. A cause of death could not be determined. Although Schaefer was never charged with their murders, it's believed that he killed them. 
A couple months after Mary and Elsie vanished in December 1972, Shaver was convicted of aggravated assault and he was sentenced to a year in jail. He was scheduled to start his sentence on January 16, 1973. On January 8, 1973, Colette Goodenough and Barbara Ann Wilcox left a relative's home in Biloxi, Mississippi. They were hitchhiking to Miami, Florida. Their families never saw or heard from them again. In Shaver's trunk, the police found Goodenough's passport and Wilcox's driver's license. Their skeletal remains were found four years later in a wooded area in Port St. Lucie, Florida. It's believed that they were Schaefer's final victims. Since Gerard Schaefer is dead, we may never know if he killed Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. Even after Schaefer was arrested, the police continued to investigate other suspects in Malarick and Farrell's case. One suspect was a 74-year-old man named William Hacker. Hacker was born in Baltimore, Maryland in June 1986. He stopped going to school after the first grade. When he was 10 years old, he was living in Barrickville, West Virginia. He managed to get a job as a miner. Hacker stayed out of trouble for most of his adult life. Now, on November 1st, 1952, Hacker, who was 56 years old, and his 43-year-old girlfriend, Vernon Nelson, got into an argument. Nelson went into a tavern, and Hacker followed her. Once inside, Nelson sat in a booth. Hacker pulled her out of the booth and then began slapping her. 31-year-old Henry Head was drinking at the bar, and he told Hacker to stop. Hacker took a swing at him, and he missed. Head managed to slam Hacker into the floor. Hacker got up and he left the tavern. About half an hour later, he walked back into the tavern and with a handgun, he shot Head and Nelson to death. In January 1953, Hacker pleaded guilty to second degree murder. He was given two concurrent life sentences. In prison, Hacker was assigned to the prison's mining team. Because Hacker had been a miner for most of his life, he was made foreman. He also became friends with the mining team's civilian supervisor, John Snyder. Snyder would take Hacker out of prison and let him stay at his home, which was near the prison. It was there that Hacker met John's wife, Betty Snyder. In 1965, Hager's sentence was commuted and he was released from prison. For the double homicide, he spent just over 10 years in prison. After Hacker was released from prison, he settled in Baltimore, Maryland. He lived on a farm with an old friend. In 1966, Hager's friend, John Snyder, died from a heart attack and Hacker became romantically involved with John's widow, Betty. Hacker continued to live in Baltimore, but he would travel at least twice a month to Moundsville, West Virginia, where Betty lived. There are several ways to get from Baltimore to Moundsville, and a few of those routes go past Morgantown. Hacker would normally take one of those routes past Morgantown. Also, Hacker had previously lived in Morgantown. Then, in the autumn of 1970, Betty started dating another man, 51-year-old Herbert Corbin. Hacker was upset to learn that Betty was dating someone else, and he threatened to kill them both. On December 23, 1970, about 11 months after Merritt Mallory and Karen Farrell were killed, Hacker drove to Moundsville, and he telephoned Betty. Herbert Corbin answered, and he told Hacker to come over for some drinks. Hacker accepted his invitation. They drank for a bit, and then they went out to a local tavern. 
Betty wanted to go home just after midnight. So Corbin drove her home in Hacker's Green Cadillac. Corbin then returned to the bar and he continued to drink and play pool with Hacker. At about 4 a.m., Hacker pounded on Betty's door. She did not open the door for him. Through the door, Hacker told her that Corbin was drunk at the bar and he was refusing to leave. He wanted Betty to come to the bar and convince Corbin to go home. But she refused to leave the house and Hacker eventually went away. Later that day, the headless body of 51-year-old Herbert Corbin was found off a mountain road not far from the bar. Hacker was arrested hours later at his home in Baltimore. Two days later, Corbin's head was found buried beside the Potomac River, about 13 miles from where his body was found. The medical examiner determined that Corbin had been shot and then decapitated. In the years before the murders, Hacker had hunted in the areas where both the body and the head were found. So many of the people who lived in and frequented the areas knew him personally. Several people who knew Hacker saw him in those areas in the hours after the murder. Also, a store owner remembered Hacker coming in and buying a hunting knife. Another store owner said that Hacker came in and purchased a shovel. Hacker claimed that Corbin's death was an accident. He said they were inside his car and they got in a fight over the gun. Hacker said it accidentally went off and Corbin was killed. In March 1971, Hacker was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. After he was arrested, the farm where he lived was searched for evidence that might have connected him to the murders of Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. However, nothing of interest was found. Hacker was also questioned about the murders of Malarick and Farrell. He denied killing the young women. He took a polygraph exam, but the results were inconclusive. Several experts do not think that William Hacker killed Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. One reason is that Hacker never targeted young women. Also, he killed two people he knew and one person he thought had wronged him. The person who killed Malarick and Farrell a few clues behind. Whereas Hacker committed his first two murders in a bar in front of witnesses. He wasn't any stealthier when he committed his third murder. There were a lot of witnesses who saw Hacker with the victim in the hours before he was killed. Also, several people who knew Hacker saw him in the areas where his victim's body and his head were dumped. Many people think that Hacker was just considered a suspect in Malarick and Farrell's murders because he was familiar with Morgantown and he had even lived in Morgantown at some point and he had also decapitated one of his victims. But they point out that none of that proves he killed the two young women. So while the police in Morgantown had promising suspects, they couldn't find anyone they could definitively tie to the murders of Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. Six years went by and no progress was made on their case. Then in mid-January 1976, the police in Morgantown received a phone call. It was the police at Camden, New Jersey. They said that a 36-year-old man who was in their custody, named Eugene Clausen, had confessed to the murders of Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. Clausen had a long rap sheet and a history of mental illness. He was in custody because he had been charged with crimes stemming from two incidents. In January 1973, he had forced a 15-year-old boy to get into his car, and then he had him perform a sex act. So on February 22, 1974, Clausen kidnapped a 13-year-old girl at gunpoint after she got off the school bus. 
He then sexually assaulted her. The district attorney and the lieutenant colonel of the West Virginia State Police, Richard Hall, traveled to Camden and they interviewed Clausen. Clausen said that he came across Malarick and Farrell while they were hitchhiking. He claimed that he pointed a gun at them and forced them to get into his car. He then drove them to the area close to where their bodies were found. Clausen said he handcuffed one of them in the front seat and then sexually assaulted the other in the back seat. He then switched them and sexually assaulted the second one in the back seat. He also apparently made them perform sex acts on each other while he watched. Clausen said he made them redress and they took them out into the woods. He shot one of them while the other one watched. While the second one begged for her life, he attacked her with the machete. He said he then dragged them by their feet and hit their bodies. He said he took the heads to show his brother. But his brother was not home, so he drove out to an abandoned mine in Point Marion, Pennsylvania. Point Marion is about 10 miles from Morgantown. Clausen was born and raised at Point Marion and he knew the area well. Clausen said he dropped the handcuffs, the gun, and the heads into the mine. Clausen's confession was 76 pages. The district attorney thought it was a genuine confession. Three days after the confession, Clausen was taken to the area where he said he dumped the gun, the heads, and the handcuffs. The police searched the area and they did not find the gun or the skulls. They did find an animal's nest that contained human hair. An expert studied the hairs and he could not determine if any of the hairs belonged to the two young women. Also, a few years earlier, a boy had found a pair of old handcuffs in the area. But a criminal identification expert said that he doubted that the handcuffs were used in the crime. Even though there was no physical evidence that validated anything that Clausen said, he was charged with the murders of Malarick and Farrell. Then in May 1976, about four months after Clausen confessed, he recanted. Clausen explained he had confessed to the murders because he was trying to get out of the charges he was facing in New Jersey. He thought that since he was innocent of Malarick and Farrell's murders, he would be acquitted. If he was acquitted, he thought that the New Jersey authorities wouldn't prosecute him. If that was indeed Clausen's plan, it was a terrible idea. He ended up pleading guilty to the charges in New Jersey, and he was sentenced to a maximum of 18 years of prison. Clausen was then sent to West Virginia where he went to trial for the murders of Marin Malarick and Karen Farrell in October 1976. The district attorney had no real physical evidence. Several witnesses did testify that they found hair in the bird's nest near the abandoned mine. However, an expert did admit that they didn't know if the hair belonged to Malarick or Farrell. The most damaging evidence was Clausen's own words. His 76-page confession was entered into evidence. One sentence in the confession pretty much sealed Clausen's fate. Clausen had said, I don't confess to things I didn't do. Clausen's defense lawyer argued that Clausen's confession was not truthful. His lawyer pointed out that there was no physical evidence that proved Clausen did any of the things he said in his confession. He explained that Clausen got the details for his confession from an article in a detective magazine. The jury ended up deliberating for less than six hours. Eugene Clausen was found guilty of both murders and he was sentenced to life in prison. Clausen's lawyer appealed and the appeal went all the way to the Supreme Court of West Virginia. In September 1980, Clausen's conviction was overturned. 
The judges ruled that gruesome photos, including ones taken after the autopsies, should not have been shown to the jury. They said that the photos did nothing to prove Clausen's guilt and they were only introduced to shock the jury. Clausen went to trial again for the murders in October 1981, five years after he was last convicted. The district attorney had much of the same evidence that was introduced in the first trial, but Clausen's lawyer had more evidence that they were hoping would prove his innocence. Clausen's lawyer entered into evidence the December 1975 Detective Magazine article that details the murders of Malarick and Farrell. The magazine was published just a month before Clausen confessed. All the details that Clausen told the police about the murders that could be verified were found in the article. The district attorney had a former cellmate of Clausen's testify. The cellmate said that as early as June 1975, Clausen had told him about the murders. He said that Clausen would have nightmares about the murders. The defense had three police officers who worked on the case testify. The three officers did not think that Clausen killed the young women because his confession did not match with the facts of the case. For example, Clausen said he dragged the women by their feet. But the evidence indicates they were dragged by their shoulders. One officer who testified was Richard Hall, who was the lieutenant colonel with the state police. Hall was the officer who Clausen confessed to. Hall noticed several problems with the confession. For example, there were no signs of sexual assault, but Clausen claimed he raped the two women who made them perform sex acts on each other. He was also light on details and specifics when it came to the sexual assaults. Hall said they pressed Clausen for more details, but Clausen was always vague. Since Clausen was always so vague, Hall did not believe he was telling the truth about the murders, therefore he did not kill Mallory and Farrell. Clausen was once again convicted of the murders. He was sentenced to life in prison, but the jury recommended mercy. So Clausen was eligible to apply for parole after 10 years. However, he first had to finish serving his 18-year sentence in New Jersey. Eugene Clausen died in prison in 2009. Clausen went to his grave denying he had killed Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. He admitted they had done a lot of bad things in his life, but he had never killed anyone. A lot of people believe him. This includes Richard Hall, the lieutenant colonel with the West Virginia State Police, who Clausen confessed to. Even after Clausen was convicted, Hall continued to investigate the murders of Mallory and Farrell. In 2009, Hall told a reporter that he was confident that he knew the identity of the killer, but he refused to reveal it. At the time of this video, the murders of Merritt Mallory and Karen Farrell are considered closed. However, many people believe that the killer got away with their murders. Thank you so much for watching today's video. We hope you found it interesting. If you're looking for some new videos to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark, and see if you can solve the mysteries in the videos. If you like riddles, puzzles, or escape rooms, Chapter Dark will be right up your alley. A link to Chapter Dark should appear on the screen momentarily, and you can also find a link in the description box below this video. If you enjoyed the video you just watched, we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a thumbs up. Please also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Roku. The links are in the description box. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching, and please stay safe.